Does education erase identity? Let's keep that in our minds as we look at this picture. Castle drawing done by a second grader. And for myself, having been a professor of the applied arts for many years, taught thousands of students, written both undergraduate and graduate curriculum, I see many things right in this picture. Great sense of proportion, color, texture, pattern. Most importantly, a great use of the imagination. Interestingly, the principal at this school brought me this piece and said, out of an entire class of over 20 kids, this one was not going to be put up on the wall. This child had committed two fatal errors. He would colored outside of the lines, and he had added dragons. Now, of course, I thought, of course the child is colored outside of the lines. He's been sitting in a desk all day having to fill out worksheets. Um, his fine motor skills uh, reserves have been used up. And how incredible that when he was told to draw a flat, static castle, instead he saw an adventure. He saw dragons attacking and brave knights shooting arrows out to defend. So I spoke with the child, and this is what he said. I'm just not a good artist. You know, dagger to the heart, right? What this school had taught this child impacted his self-identity. The problem here is not that the child used his imagination. The problem is the system. The system that told him and punished him for using his imagination. So let's look and see what the dragons are, the problems or the dragons within our educational system today. Okay? First of all, let's all understand that the style of education used within the United States is based upon the industrial age educational model. 250 years ago, children were educated to be able to perform menial tasks as a part of factory living and factory working. Do the same thing over and over and over for eight hours. Makes sense you're going to sit at a desk all day long. You're going to learn how to do that. Well, guess what, guys? We're way past the, in the uh, industrial age. We're now living in the education age and in the uh, information age, actually. And so, why are we educating children today in the same method and manner for jobs that have ceased to exist? They didn't have cars during the industrial age, okay? And now we're looking at having cars that can drive themselves. We're in a different era. Next, we look at the pet monkey mentality. This is where we parade kids out and say, hey, look what they can do. My four-year-old can read. Well, if a four-year-old can read, shouldn't every four-year-old be able to read? And guess what? If they can't, let's label them as having something wrong with them, and maybe we should even medicate them to be able to make them sit still to then learn to read. Pet monkey mentality. Next, we have screen dependency and nature deficiency. Kids spend an, uh, uh, between five and seven hours on a screen each day. A uh, recent study was done looking at how much time is actually spent outside. 30% of kids spending less than half an hour. 50% of all kids spending less than an hour outside every day. Great book, um, Last Child in the Woods, if you're interested in hearing more about that. Well, when we combine all of these things, what do we get? A denial of the intrinsic value of a child and the respect due that child as a born person. The concept of the born person was first put forth by an educational innovator named Charlotte Mason. And it simply means this. A child is due the respect and consideration as an adult, as you and me. Now, there are great dangers of these dragons, the primary one being the loss of self. So what defines identity? Let's think about it. What makes me, me? What makes you, you? It are the, it's the beliefs, it's the passions, it's the interests, it's the talents. Is school educating towards this? Um, when we don't, as educators, address the things that are special about our students, they suffer a loss of uniqueness. And from this, we have a loss of meaning. Now, before you think I'm just piling on the whole educational system and everyone within it is evil, I want to ask this question. Does this mean that education is inherently damaging? Absolutely not. Education is a cornerstone of a civilized uh, country. And when we don't have education, there are great losses that occur. Just look at countries where certain segments of the population are denied education due to maybe economics, due to gender. Um, so there's great freedom that comes from knowledge. So 
really what I'm talking about here is a systematic issue versus an individual issue of educators. Now, what is our evid evidence that these dragons do exist? The things that I'm going to talk about now are issues that we see facing our youth in America today. Now, education, I'm not suggesting is the sole cause of these problems. However, I firmly believe that it is a contributing factor to them. First of all, violence against others and self. Physical violence, cyber violence, um, and then we look at the violence against oneself. Do you know, in grades 7 to 12, over 5,200 kids each day try to take their own lives. Rampant depression, uh, the diagnosis of ADHD, and the um, significant drugging to control ADHD. Do you know our country consumes 80 to 90 percent of all ADHD medication worldwide? Does that mean that American children have a larger ADHD problem than the rest of the world? Or does it mean that the school system in which they're being educated demands a style of education that requires drugging to be able to operate within it? Finally, we look at addiction, substance abuse. Uh, is one example. And of course, screen addiction. We'll talk more about that later. How are children experiencing these dragons in education today? What is the dragon's breath and how is it being manifested? The first is the don't move uh, concept, the restraint of activity. You know what? It doesn't matter that you're six years old. You're going to sit in your desk eight hours today. Um, and if you move, if you tap your foot, uh, if you raise your hand, you're going to be told to sit still and not move. Now, this is not a worldwide phenomenon. You may have recently read about uh, some, some changes happening within Finland's education. Finland is viewed as one of the leaders worldwide in education, highly successful educational program. Very different from how we educate here in the United States. For every hour of instruction, 15 minutes of it is a break. So you teach for 45 minutes, your students have a 15-minute break. And that's not just once in the day. That's throughout the entire day. Children are not expected to sit at a desk without moving. Next, we look at the no talking. This is the communication clampdown that occurs where kids are hardly speaking in school. Maybe I can raise my hand and ask a question, but maybe I'm going to get a stare. Like, it's not your turn to talk. I put my hand down. How often am I going to keep trying um, before I stop raising my hand? Finally, this is what I call the do this and this and this and this and this. It's the overscheduling we keep hearing about in children's lives today. But where we're hearing about it is after school. Don't have your kids in so many after school activities. It's also happening within school. And so when we look at scheduling, we need to think where is the freedom within it? Um, in the last 20 years, kids have lost 12 hours of free time each week, essentially free time to play. And so when we look at a schedule within a school, we need to look and see what can we do to minimize this sense of pointless busyness. We're moving a step up now. What is the dragon's fire? This is the misinformation about ability and potential that has become inherent within our school system. Uh, tr a quote has been attributed to Albert Einstein in which uh, it's basically said everyone's a genius, but if you tell a fish it's got to swim up a tree, it's going to spend its whole life thinking that it's stupid. By the way, uh, Einstein had on, written on his report card at one point that he'll never amount to anything. Ansel Adams was labeled a hopeless and rebellious student. Um, now we know he was most likely an undiagnosed dyslexic. And from, uh, as a youth, he was taken out of school. His parents noticed that being in nature calmed him tremendously. And of course, he went on to become uh, arguably the most famous and talented nature photographer, and by the way, ended up getting honorary doctorates from both Harvard and Yale. You know, so much for being a hopeless student. Now, we're at the point of discussing being roasted by the flame. This is the denial and theft that is inherent within the system. So, first of all, let's talk about the denial. The denial of what for us as Americans are core rights. From the inception of this country, we've all held the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I would ask, how many kids sit in school and are really happy to be there? Children love to learn, but many, an enormous number, do not enjoy school. I know I didn't, and guess what? I was the valedictorian of my class. Being a girl as well, 
I was who our educational system has been designed for. It was designed primarily by women for a female learning style. So if for me, I'm not enjoying it, I'm not finding happiness, what does it mean for the other 50%, the, the young men in our, in our educational system? I know I used to stare at the clock waiting for the class to be over, for the day to be over, staring out the window, coming up with fantasies and stories in my mind. It wasn't until late in my school experience that I was transferred to a school that was highly creative um, and really began to enjoy my learning experience. When we take away from children the right to pursue their happiness, we're, in essence, perpetrating the theft of their childhood. And in this way, this is why I say education currently is being perpetrated. Now, let's think about what got us here. There's that clock I talked about. I'm sure you guys have seen many of those in your classrooms. Um, we've got to think about where kids are spending the majority of their meaningful hours each day, and the reality is Within the United States, it's required that it be spent at school. Kids may be here six and a half, seven, eight, sometimes nine hours a day. By the time they get home uh, and have done other activities, the energy reserves to pursue things of personal interest may have been depleted. So it is incumbent upon the schools to give space for our students to pursue subjects that interest them and not just once a semester, once a year, when you get older. I'm talking about from the earliest of grades. Next, we have to think about how we're educating. I believe we're on a hamster wheel of meaningless busyness with uh, worksheets. I know um, many schools where that is the primary work product that children put out. They don't speak in class. Um, they might get to write one report a semester, but it's the worksheet product, particularly in younger ages. So we've got to think about where is what we're doing getting us? Are we going nowhere? Finally, we have to think about why we're educating the way we are. We've all heard about teaching to the test, okay? When you teach to the test, you teach for answers over abilities, okay? This is when yes becomes no. When I say yes to one thing, worksheets, I'm saying no to something else, imagination. Now, I know that sounds hopeless, but it's not. We have seven swords to slay these dragons in education, also known as the intentional individual involvement. First of all, we must design an educational program that is age and stage appropriate. Stanford came out with a study recently, fascinating, that if you delayed kindergarten by one year, you'd have an over 70% reduction in ADHD in later years. But for some reason, despite this evidence, we keep saying, you know what, let's get younger in kindergarten. Let's uh, have enforced sitting at desks, writing, reading, before many children are developmentally ready to do that. Next, as I mentioned, we must encourage personal interest. Maybe little Bobby loves sharks and little Susie wants to be an astronaut. Well, let's give them space within the school day where they are mentored and guided from an academic perspective of how to learn about these things. So you may have a class of 30 kids with 30 different interests. That's okay. Let's teach them how to find out about what interests them from the youngest of ages, first grade. Next, we must equip our students with life skills. Did you know that public speaking is the number one fear of people over death? I found that shocking. 40 to 45 percent of people are afraid to speak in public. Well, it's because we're not being given the chance or being taught or being able to practice and fail within our classrooms where we should be able to. I'm involved in certain educational programs where, guess what, children speak every week individually in front of their class. They give presentations, almost think like a show and tell, from the earliest of ages, four years old. And you may have a student that's shy and scared at the beginning and can barely say his or her name, but I'll tell you, by the end of the year, after they've given 24 presentations, it is awe-inspiring to see the, ste the steps that this child can make. We must allow space for children to speak in front of others in our schools. Continuing, we need to balance technology. Now, we're in an information age. Technology is a critical part of our lives. But we need to be educating for those jobs in technology, not with excessive technology. Great book called Glow Kids talks about the dangers of excessive screen use and how addiction has become a part of our screen culture. 
digital heroin, if you will, and how excessive screen use actually impacts the brain and uh, degrades the brain in the same way that cocaine addiction does. Uh, the screen is not bad. Excessive screen use is bad. How do we use technology in education? We need to learn through doing. This is the get out of your desk, get up, try something. Let's have a project together. Let's move. I think of that James Brown song about, you know, get up off your seat whenever I think about this. We've got to get moving. We've got to interact. Benjamin Franklin has a great quote where he talks about, you know, I see these things and whatever, whatever, but finally, if I do them, I learn. Creativity and imagination must be prized. So when we ask a kid to draw a picture of a castle, um, let's encourage them to get creative with it. Um, instead of saying, just draw a castle, say, draw me a story that includes a castle. Now, you may wonder about this child that drew this picture. Um, his story has a very happy ending. He was removed from this school and put into a creative learning environment and flourished. And the reason I know that is because he's my child. Play. Now, many people may think this is a four-letter word. I'm sorry for those of you that are offended by my using a four-letter word. But in education, it is vital that we leave space to play. You know, I mentioned the Finnish educational model and how they take breaks every hour for 15 minutes. There have been recent news articles about how in the United States, certain schools have chosen to do that. Not every hour. They take four 15-minute breaks in a day and have seen incredible increases in productivity, attention. For some reason, these are just the shiny examples versus the norm. They are the exception rather than the rule. I'm suggesting, I'm pleading that we revamp the U.S. educational system to take these factors into account. And let's also remember that play is not only for the youngest ones of us. It is for everyone. We must consider what play looks like for kindergarten and how that's different from middle school and high school. So as you hear about schools bragging about their intensive academics and their preparatory preschools, and touting their magnificent test scores, I want you to think of this question, critical concept. Is America trading our children's identities for A's? Thank you.